This episode of Rock on Tours was recorded before the passing of Shane McGowan. Hello, Gary. Hello, Guy. How are you? Yeah, uh, I'm a little bit chilly today. The weather's turned, hasn't it? You know, so you can see I'm wearing a sweater. I can see you're. It's a very nice sleeveless sweater. I like those. Sleeveless. Well, my um, arms, my arms are not too bad. It's my chest these days, you know. Oh, I know your chest. <laughs> but um, well, you think it's a bit chilly where you are? I'm up on the South Downs with uh, my village cut off by flooding. Oh, really? so uh, yeah, only at one end. Um, but, but flood, yeah, flood close. actually worked. I think probably with one of our. Well, th- exactly, uh, which is exactly why I said it, which is uh, a great little segue there. Um, <laughs> this is Steve Lillywhite, the, one of the great and, uh, producers. Yes, and uh, although he didn't actually produce Here Comes the Flood because it was on the first album, he did do the third album by Peter Gabriel. So oh, okay, like, okay, okay. So, um, no, I mean, Steve Lillywhite is probably, I'd say, to indie art music what Trevor Horn is to pop music, really, isn't he? Absolutely, yeah. He's basically defined new wave. I mean, it starts with you know, you know, he got Ultravox signed. I know, I saw that with their demos. Uh, Amazing, Ultra, and, Ultravox with an exclamation mark. That's that's how they. Used that's right. To, that's when they were going to be a musical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they got that. They stole that from from Neu or one of those German crowd, you know, rock bands, you know, who who also had the exclamation mark. All oh, right, yeah. My Bill Frindle moment is is obviously. Come on, yeah. It's going to be this is going to be a long one, I think. It's, well, I'm not going to go through the lot because because you know I've I've edited it slightly, uh, but I mean he's produced. He produced XTC, Susie and the Banshees. Obviously, we said Ultrabox, Simple Minds, Talking Heads, uh, U2, Rolling Stones, uh, got Morrissey, Peter Gabriel. He has six Grammy Awards. And he was he was a dear friend of mine. I worked with him a lot back in the day. Um, and some of my favourite musical moments, actually, are from, you know, working with Steve, which was with Kirsty McCall. And uh, it was with him that I played on the duet that Debbie Harry and Iggy Pop did. Yeah. But you see so, the things about Steve is he he sort of he was there at the beginning of the some of those sounds, you know, with, with people like Susan. The- well, that album. I mean The Scream. P- the the scream the scream yeah which 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 is kind of the birth of post punk I was listening to Absolutely. Hong Kong Garden yesterday and it's brilliant well it's the guitarist isn't it it was John John McC- McGeek McC- yeah. McC- no no it wasn't McGeek oh no it wasn't it was is it McKay. Sutherland Mackay no. Mackay John McKay McKay I've never known how to pronounce this, that 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 name and and of course uh, and Ken, and um, uh, Kenny Morris on drums I mean that kind of sound that he was he was creating with them too led to, onto you too obviously and well not you but you too that's right but also interestingly enough the what, the famous eighties drum sound which is kind of for some reasons got attached to Hugh Padgham and Phil Collins but that actually comes from the Peter Gabriel three album yep. which Steve produced yeah but when it's particularly the track uh, Intruder Intruder yeah so we'll ask him all about this and and much more he's currently residing in Bali apparently lucky sod up mate he's not flooded okay let's get him on welcome to the Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. That's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I've been sitting in the back of the car coming into London. They're brilliant. That caused a big problem in the band, actually. I was having too much fun. Thank you guys for still being around, still making music, still being into it, and doing this podcast. It, it's uh, it's fabulous. Well, I get the feeling that us three should go for a party. That's what I think. I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. To get really good at something. Yeah. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Keep on rocking! Ah. Testing, one, two, over. Can you hear me? We over. can. Oh, my God. Gary Kemp, how do you do? <laughs> can we see you, Steve? Oh, yes, you... Sorry, I'm not as good in real life, but there you go. That's me. How do you oh, do? Nice to meet you. Well, I, I, I've known Guy for many, many years, and... Um, yes. I've never met you, but that's one hell of a jumper. You know, we were discussing this before you came on, the fact that I was a bit chilly today. It's kind of my uh, Paul McCartney vest. I thought it was Clive Dunn. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, Tommy period Pete Townsend used to wear those jumpers quite a lot. I can't, you're like, yeah, I mean, it's just sort of like... The cyclical nature of art is a fascinating thing isn't it? <laughs> it really is it's, 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 i find it absolutely fascinating like the mullet which bono used to 
always say how much he hated the mullet in the 80s. My daughter now, she's 21, and she thinks it's the coolest thing, and she's got the mullet of mullets. Yeah. The new Robbie Williams documentary, there he is with his mullet, right? Oh, right. Okay, I haven't seen it yet, but it's on my list. Oh, fantastic. Whereas, whereas you, you, Steve, seem to have opted for the sort of full Travis Bickle. Oh, no, well, not quite. It's, it's you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the minoxidil every day, but it doesn't really help, does it? You know, it's, it's. I used to have wonderful locks back in the day, Gary. You didn't know me, but, but I was the, um, you know, and then... All of a sudden, you hit 60. I'm actually quite pleased, Steve, because I thought you still had, because you and I both had those sort of Hugh Grant floppy... You know. we, we were, and, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so and, uh, so welcome aboard is all I can say. Can, Hello. I, can, I, can I just take you back to that mullet thing again? Because I, I probably may have said this before, but we are about rock, aren't we? So the mullet, the 80s gets blamed for the mullet, but actually right. Bowie. Uh, I mean, Aladdin Sane. Oh, Aladdin, yes. 100% the first mullet. But actually, it wasn't Bowie. Bowie was influenced by Marie Helvin, who did the front cover of a Nova magazine wearing a kabuki wig. And Bowie oh. looked at that and he said to his hairdresser, I'd like one of those. Blame the kabukis, the Japanese. Another honorary mention for the mullet, pre 80s mullet, is Bruce Foxton. Who I did his only ever hit solo That's, record. You it was did. called Freak. And, um, and it was so funny. <laughs> It's such a crazy record. It, it was a top 10 single, actually. But, um, oh God, it's a kitchen sink production, I tell you. I, I listened to it the other day because, you know, I don't know about you guys, but do you ever listen to your records? Well, now I've almost at the tail end of my life let alone career, I've gone back and listened not only to records I've made, but obviously to the records that I grew up with. And I'm a huge fan of rock on tours, I have to tell you, Gary. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've told um, Guy this many times, but I've, I've listened to literally everyone. And there are so many things that I go, I, I met Jack Hargreaves when I was 10 years old. I was, <laughs> not, I was nearly country boy. I need to tell them. And then it's like, my favorite album when I was 13 was Egg, The Polite Force. Visit to a Newport Hospital is one of my favourite fucking songs ever. You know, and, 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 and it's like, you know, prog rock was so big and, and, and you know, and, and, and the connection that almost every single person on the podcast has to David Bowie, you know, is, mm -hmm. is for me, I, I, you know, Hunky Dory is the album that, you know, it far, for me, far at, is so much better than Ziggy Stardust because it's whimsical and it's got all this sort of this wonderful piano playing and orchestrations. Mm -mm -mm -mm. And then, Life on Mars, you know, I, I, you know, you know yeah, one of the yeah. songs I've ever written. Well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, It'll just work. fantastic. So, so I just want to say your your um, <laughs> touchstones are the, the same the, as yours. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, and I know I, I um, Gary, you're almost the same age as Kirsty almost to the uh she was born 10th of october 1950 oh. 50 59 right are you born yeah, in 59 i'm 16th yeah. of october 59 16th yeah. of october yeah that's right um so you know it was very much uh you know and, and me and her we, we we very much had the similar musical taste it's i'm five years older than you basically so what, and, what, did, what was your first sort of moment of, of music that that you you still cling on to even now oh well Weirdly, it, it was Bowie, but before then, well, I was, you were either an enemy, a melody maker or a sounds. That's and right. I was, I was where a Where is this, Steve? Where is it? This is at school. I'm, I'm yeah, this presuming. was at school. I was. Where, and where is this? This is Egham near Windsor. That's right. I basically, um, with a name like Lily White, I was never the cool guy. So um, I was ridiculed horrendously at school, like boys do, you know, grammar school, by the Welcome skin. to my world. By the skin. Yes, exactly, Mr. <laughs> Pratt. You know, so you and me, we definitely, we definitely have similarities. I, I was, I was Kemp's biscuit. You, you, that. you right. pointed that out to me when we, the first time I did a session with you. It's quite funny. Oh, really? I remember, I always remember you saying that. So, yeah, 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 but, but it, it, then I, I picked. Then my neighbour got a guitar. He wanted a, a, you know, like let's form a band. I, Steve, you play the bass. So I bought a Hofner violin for fifteen, no, thirty quid which my dad helped me, you know, it's the same old story everyone has really. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and I loved, and, and from then on, I was just, I got a few cool points because my band was a school band and we'd entered a sort of the Slough Arts Festival. 
the band came third and oh you don't know this guy and i got an I award don't. i love it I, I got an award for the most outstanding musician basically as a bass player all i did was play fast because my favorite band at the time was 10 years after oh yeah and <sighs> of course they all they did was play as far every single person in the band just played fast That's you realized funny. after a while that 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 you know, if anything, bass is one of those things that is nothing to do with how fast you play. I think the world has missed out on the fact that you two didn't get together and write songs because Lily White Pratt would have been the greatest songwriter. <laughs> oh, God, that would be terrible. <laughs> but, yes. but, I, but so you are a melody maker, man. I was a melody maker, man. Um, so I, that's I, more I used prog, to go... isn't it? That's, that's prog. Well, it's prog, it? but blues as well. I remember going to okay. the Melody Maker Blues Festivals at the Albert Hall and being, you know, and, 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 and buying Mr. Wonderful, the Fleetwood Mac album with the double gatefold with Mick Fleetwood being so tall across both and loving those early, well, loving that album, which was just an, an album of 12 bar blues, but then loving Albatross and oh, yeah. loving Green Man Alici and, 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 um, and Oh Well was, it's like one of the greatest things you know it's just brilliant so i and, got albatross as a re-release i think we all got it it was a reissue in the 70s was it did you is that maybe that's when or were you... no 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 i remember the beatles first time round. oh yeah and and do you yeah you you must do you guy i remember one of my earliest musical memories is seeing the beatles on top of the pops and i right. can't remember what the song was but i remember they seeing top of the pops. because i remember them being number one and i must have been incredibly young because i remember thinking oh, they're number, they're one, number one, one now gary what's the, <laughs> what's the point of anyone else making a record if the beatles are number one yeah. oh well i remember no, seeing I... them on the london palladium show that was my first yeah but i always remember the beatles were different because every time they had a new single out you knew it was the Beatles, but you knew it sounded different to all the other bands. When, other, when all the other bands had a new single out, it sounded too similar to their old one. You know, Dave Clark Five and all those other bands mm. around that time. But the Beatles, every time they had a new record, it was like they were taking us on a journey. You know, and I, and I really felt that, you know, because I've done more than one album with a few bands. And it was always my thing that you didn't copy what you did on the previous record on the next one you know because it's going to be the same band anyway so you know it's going to be the same singer so there's that connection but 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 production wise i would always try and 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 say no well that might work on that song but we did that on the last album so let's try and you know and of course probably with you too that was something that they was in their you know yeah. world domination plans as well were you, were you was there a moment then when you sort of thought i'm more fascinated in the architecture of a song or a recording than i am in playing it or posing in front of the yeah. mirror well what happened was is that i was in the school band and i won this competition and it was in the local paper and then i i i i, I said to my dad he you know because i was nothing at school I was not, you know, I was just last. I managed to scrape through my 11 plus and go to a grammar school. But I, you know, I, I didn't do anything. And, 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 and I got this job in a studio by basically lying about having got a, um, a physics O level because that's what you needed to get the job. This was in, in 1972. Now I'd done the exam, but the result hadn't come through. So I said to my, so my boss said, you need a physics O level. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my result hasn't come through, but, but I'm, you know, I probably passed it. Anyway, in the exam, I went in, signed my name, and after 15 minutes, walked out. Because, you know, you had to do that. So I knew I hadn't passed it. But of course, I had a three-month trial, and I was like, Mr. Enthusiastic Young Boy, anyone want tea? And I was a tape op. And it was at the last recording studio in the world that had a separate machine room to the control room. So instead of having a studio and a, only two rooms, you had a studio, a control room, and where I sat, which was called room B, and I had a little oratone next to my ear, and there was a microphone on the desk, and basically I had to press play and record oh, when amazing. the, when, and, and, and there was nothing on the desk that could run the tape machine. So I had to be at my station all the time. Oh. So I became like an amazing tape op because I would always listen and I go, maybe they want to do the second verse again. So I would, at the end of the take, I would roll back to just like 10 seconds before the second verse and wait. So then the engineer would say, or the producer would say through the mic, can we do the second verse again? And I was, and I was you know, I wanted to be the fastest gun uh -huh. 
you know, so Which I was studio, a, what studio is this? Thing? Well, it was called Phonogram. And before that, it okay. was Phillips. And after that, it was Solid Bond. Solid Bond. That's right. Paul Weller's studio. Paul Weller's um, studio on We were Marble talking Arch. about this with, 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 that's where Roy Woods used to do, that's Which where is all the what I, stuff was done. I was tape up on all those Roy Woods oh records. My oh, my God. God. Great. I, oh, I was, fantastic. I was on top of the pops with Wizard as the back end of a horse. <laughs> for, I, for either See My Baby Jive, uh, Angel Fingers, Rock and Roll Winter, or it's going to be uh, uh, the Christmas one. One of them. That's we incredible. But, but, it's a shame, but that, that, it's a shame that didn't blossom into the panto career that you were clearly <laughs> hoping for. <laughs> yes, I was... That was with Aisha, apparently. She was the, she was the you know, who had her own... Oh, Aisha, well, well, this is another thing that you've been taught. I don't know in what context, but we did Aisha's single with Roy Wood at the recording studio. Oh. And, um, and, you know, it was so weird. Like, recording those, those Wizard singles took weeks and weeks and weeks to do one single. But there was no click track. Roy would go in and do an acoustic guitar on its own first. Think of uh, See My Baby Jive. I mean, everything was done so s slowly, but there was never a guide vocal on the song. Never. And the thing that recorded, like in literally in real time, was the vocal at the very end of recording. I had no idea what, I mean, it was all in Roy's head. That guy was an absolute genius. Yeah. And actually, before I started at the studio, there was a, uh, do you remember an ELO song called 10538 Overture? Yes, 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 yes. Which is fantastic. It's got that descending. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I bet you don't know why it was called 10538 Overture. No. No, it was the serial number on the mixing desk of the studio that I worked at. Oh, my God. <laughs> and um... <laughs> wow. I wonder if Jeff Lynn owns that now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's, that's still around. How many tracks? I'm not sure about Jeff. <laughs> but so, does this mean? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was, that was 24 track. They were. Uh, <laughs> I, I started at the right. studio in 1972, just as they'd gone from 16 to 24. But does this mean? So if you go into your little room and you're running the tape machine, that it's possible that an artist could come in, do a whole session, and leave and have no and not actually no idea know that you existed. who was in there. It was the loneliness. <laughs> the, the, the something of the long distance runner. The, right. You know, I, I literally I would get the occasional roadie coming in to give me a little bit of speed or a joint or something now and again. Uh. But, um, <laughs> but 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 honestly, it was. I was never allowed in the control room and I was never allowed to press my talk back to enter the conversation. So it was, so, so this is the You're story. Below, so, below stairs. You were literally below stairs. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I could just about peek into the control room, but because my boss was, you know, they it, that was in the day where a studio would provide not only an assistant, but an engineer as well. So uh, how could I get my promotion from tape op to engineer? if I was always in the other room and yeah. never seeing the desk and all the knobs and buttons. So at weekends, my boss would allow me to go in to do um, demos with, you know, just to learn my craft. So I took in this band that was called Tiger Lily that uh, then changed its name to... Ultravox. Ultravox. Yes. Well done, you see. And this might be the about the only time my career and Gary's have sort of been close because... <laughs> because yeah. they, I went off on a whole different thing, and you did. But there was a little time, was. you know, because there uh, was really it was the. I mean, the Roland TR, you know, seventy seven or whatever it was, the drum machine that that yeah, you yeah. Know, at the beginning of that British bands bringing in German electronica to to the. You know, oh, absolutely! You know, I, I remember. Well, I did the demos with Ultravox, and they got signed to Island Records, and 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 Island Records said you know, who do you want to do your album? They said, well, we've been working with this kid, Steve Lillywhite, who we, we like. And they said, well, you know, you need to have someone else. And they, uh, and they said, well, we love Roxy Music. I mean, they were like a punky Roxy Music in they a were. way. Mm -hmm. and, and so they said, well, we'll get Brian Eno. And um, so that was the first time I met Brian. And if you've ever worked with Brian, he's, he's absolutely brilliant, but yeah. he, he's never there all the time. You know, but in a good way, not in a Rick Rubin way, in a way that he, you know, he cut. 
<laughs> well, I had to drop that one in, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> but, but, yeah. I guess, I guess that's Steve. I guess that's because you're you're coming from the engineering side of things. Therefore, you're in the room. You've got to be in the room where these guys are from the music side and the arty side. Yeah, we got to go. For weirdly, a walk. I even came from less than that. I came from the tape hopping side. Mm. I mean, my my engineering abilities were very very. I mean, I was a musician, as I say. I was, well, I yeah, was but you, you literally weren't allowed in the room. I wasn't allowed <laughs> like... in the room. So, so it, so, so I was just, you know, bluffing it, really, because I, I, I had no, um, and I didn't obviously get my physics O level. But by the time the results came in, I was already got the job, you know, and no one ever said anything. But so, so yeah, so Ultravox was, you know, um, and and that was great because. I knew him before he was John Fox when his name was. Oh, you've got me. Oh, oh come on, wow. Gary. Come on, Gary. What was John Fox's uh, real name? I don't know. Dennis Dennis Lee is his oh, real name. Is it really? Dennis <laughs> Lee, yeah. But, but, Wasn't but, he a footballer? <laughs> Dennis Lee, right? <laughs> yeah. so you're getting you're getting two footballers mixed up there. Franny Lee. Right, yeah, right. I know. <laughs> Dennis Wise is a friend of mine, actually. But anyway, uh, I digress. I digress. <laughs> so, um, and then I was, you know, I I, I got this, um, you know, I, I I got my first production credit, which was a three-way production credit of the first Ultravox album, which was produced by Brian Eno, Ultravox, and Steve Lillywhite, engineered by me. So yes, I, as you say, I did come from the engineering side, but but not really that much. You you just you were kind of at the cusp then of discovering a new style of post punk music, right? So Ultravox, yeah. but this is before punk. It was slightly before punk yeah. because yeah, because it, I, yes, right. But what it you know the, it was it was burgeoning, wasn't it? This then they, yeah. they had a, they had a very punk, different interest. Punk was my um, was my entry point, you know, into the music business because. It was. It's very much producing is a catch twenty two situation. You know, how do you get the work if you don't get the hit? But you need the hit to get the work. So mm -hmm. all of a sudden there was this sort of wave called punk that that I was that I just rode on, and I, I was lucky enough that my friend knew Johnny Thunders, and uh, and he just moved to London with his Heartbreakers, and uh, they had an album called L A M F. You probably right. remember on, with, with track records. This was track at the end records, of track records. Wasn't had songs it? Yeah. like you know, uh, "Get Up for the Phone." No, but uh, great, really good songs actually. Yeah. Um, Chinese but, rocks, Chinese rocks, Chinese rocks. Yes, I wonder what that was about. But anyway, girlfriend crying in the shower stall. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I got to know Johnny, and I was like saying, "Johnny, you're, uh, you know, I don't think your album sounds very good." And everyone was telling him that, you know, says, and he was doing a, um, doing a solo album. And he signed to Real Records, it was, which had something to do with with the Pretenders as well. So I did this album with Johnny Thunders, which was fantastic. It had a who's who of the people at the time. It had Phil Linnert, it had Stevie Marriott, it had uh, Stephen Paul from the Sex Pistols, Peter Perrett from The Only Ones was brilliant on it. What was it like in the room? I mean, you're not dealing with the easiest people. I mean, let's face it, there's a little junkies and alcoholics, or whatever. I mean, how was it? How were you corralling them in? Well, I realised, and, and I've worked with, a, with with quite a few people who who like to, to get loaded, is that you try and get them early and you try and you try and get them when they're on good form. And when they're on good form, you just do as much as you possibly can. You know, you push them. When they're doing well, you know, you think I'm maybe I'm tired, but they're not. We we have to really get because tomorrow they may not be doing so well. But anyway, with Johnny Thunders, there was this fantastic song called "You Can't Put Your Arms Around a Memory." Around a memory, which what a title! Well, it's one of the great records. Yeah. And 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 during the recording, the manager of Susie and the Banshees came into the studio and said, "Oh, I like that drum sound." And now Susie and the Banshees had just recorded their first single for Polydor, but they had, Neil Stevenson was the manager and he came in and he basically, uh, but they had complete artistic control. That was one of the reasons they signed to Polydor um, because at that point, you know, Susie had been on uh, the, 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 the Grundy show and, you know, there was, a, she'd done the Lord's Prayer at the, the thing. There was a lot of talk about Susie and the Banshees, but they hadn't released a record. So I knew, and, and they recorded Hong Kong Garden with an American producer and they didn't like it. 
So I knew that when they asked me, would you like to record our new single? I went, if, if I can do a version of the song that the band like, then it will be released and it will be a hit. And, and yeah, that's what I, I, I did because, so that was started my thing that, you know, I must make records that the band like. It's nothing to do with my ego or anything like that. How, how did you develop that song though? It was Hong Kong Garden. Was, was it, was, was that arrangement how they were playing it? I mean, we were talking earlier, John McKay, is, is, how, did he, how did he pronounce his name? John McKay. Amazing player. Yeah. Influenced so many And people. I am back in touch with him. He oh. has been a, he's been a painter and decorator for 30 years. And um, it's so weird. He was so influential on so many guitar players, you know, and... Um, not just McGeoch, who came later, but also like, you know, right. I mean, the, well, edge, the edge, Johnny edge Mars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Johnny yeah. Mar. They, 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 and, um, and he's wants to do something again, but I, I'm talking to him about, you know, maybe I don't know what we could do, but, um, but he's, he's really great. But they had a drummer who, Kenny Morris, he was a, an art yeah. school, he was an art school boy. He wasn't a drummer, he wasn't a musician, you know, and, and that was fine. I, for me, it doesn't matter if people are musicians. I, I've got the, a lot of uh, empathy for working with someone, you know, and it doesn't, you know, I, I heard Trevor Horn say last week with you that, you know, it's, it's, you know, he, he can play everything better than anyone else, but, you know, even if I could, it wouldn't be the thing to do. It's like part of your job is to make a band strong. It's not about, it's not about pulling the band apart for me. And how do you make them strong? You, you, you make the weakest link stronger. So, you know, it's, it's that's part of my philosophy anyway. But that's because you're very much, a, that, that's what makes you a band producer, isn't it? Yeah, really? As it's just to, easier. Just it's easier producer, to produce yeah. bands because they have a basis of a sound. <laughs> For me, the worst thing in the world is when an artist goes, I'll do whatever you want, Steve. It's like, I don't know what I want. Yeah. But if you, if you give me 10 ideas, I'll go, oh, that one's good. I'll take a bit of that. I'll take a bit of that. And let's, let's make a record. A bit like a bloody... Blue Peter television presenter, to be honest. So to go back to Hong Kong Gardens, were you aware of? Because this is because listening to it now, you know, this really is sounds pretty good, new, right? New soundscape, a new landscape. It you know, it is. It, it, you know, mm. in in much the way, it, and it's in a kind of in in a sort of fuller way than say Joy Division or someone. I would say, but yeah, well, Joy Division was all based on 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 Martin Hannett's use of the Marshall Time Modulator which was a fantastic piece of kit that only Martin Hannett knew how to get the best out of. In fact, I would follow him sometimes into a studio and I would immediately go to the Marshall time modulator and make sure that I didn't change any of the settings and just plug something into it just to see what it was because he may not have zeroed it at the end of his session. What, what, what was that, a delay machine or something? The, well, it was, yes, it was a phasing. All those Joy Division records, everything Martin Hannett did was was through the Marshall Time Modulator. It was a it was a great piece of kit, oh. but I never. It was not my kit. I, I didn't really know how to use it. So I think I think the question that we're trying to get to is is, is yes, was that arrangement Susie's uh, Susie in the Badger's right. Would you build that in the studio? Yeah, we built it in the well. Obviously, they'd recorded it once. But what I realised was that 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 um, the drummer. I, the, the drum sound I wanted, I couldn't get with him playing the drums all at the same time. So I did the cymbals separately. So I would get him to do the the the, uh, the drums and, and yeah. the toms. So and that was something that I did a lot over the years was was ah. was making records that sounded like a band playing all at the same time, but literally building it up one drum at a time. Well, you were, you were famous for your snare miking, wasn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Well, like, no, say, take, take 12 big, mics big on a snare. <laughs> yes, take Big Country or something like that. Or Simple Minds. Those uh, The Simple Minds album, everything was done individually, you know. And um, although when you put it all together, it sounds like a band playing. Sure, but I never heard of anyone doing the drums individually. But did you ever mention yeah. this to Peter Gabriel? And he went, oh, interesting. I, maybe we won't put the cymbals on at all, but we'll get to that. No, 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 yeah. we can get to that one because... Get, well, that's like, yeah, 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 no, that's a whole other can of worms. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, because there, there's this period, like there's Hong Kong Garden. Local operator, was that around that time or was that later? Oh, my God, yes, that Do was you remember? Joe. I, that's, Joe. That's, Joe. Did you know them? Yeah. I... And I knew him. I um my first ever band, Speedball, 
um, we <laughs> became his backing band when oh local operate, when when um, they split. Which oh, and who I, are you talking about? Uh, Joe, um, what's, what's his, his last name? name? His brother Byron, worked for you too for many years. So I, I he, sort was of... the, he was the, the driving force behind Local Operator. And I, yeah. I remember it was quite a big deal when you did their single. They were going to be a sort of big thing. I mean, certainly yeah. around the world of the members, which is where I was hanging out. So Right, right, right. No, they didn't. They Yeah. And uh, he went down yeah. one route and, you know, yeah. it's a bit, a bit sad. It's but a bit yeah, sad. I mean, I, 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 I suppose XTC was another good one at the time. Oh, you know, God, yeah. For, I mean, God, yeah. Yeah, but for me, punk rock was a great attitude, which is something that you probably will will agree with. You know, the attitude of punk rock was great. It was, but but as a musical art form, it was limited. And I didn't, I wanted to never work in my life. So I thought, if I have a hit, it means I can then choose who I want to work with. See, I didn't have this ego of saying, now I'm successful, now I've had a hit, I can make anyone good. It was more like, now I've had a hit, I can be my own personal A&R man and work with people who I know are going to be great. And, and that's uh, all of a sudden my, my, my level of choosing artists. And I very much knew who I could work with and who I couldn't. So, you know, even if I was offered, you know, because you have a hit and everyone goes, oh, you, you're on someone's list. And I go, well, no, I may be on your list. But if I say no to you, you don't really need want me to work with you because the reason is I don't think I can do a good job for you. And I realized that when I did Toya, you know, as much as Toya oh. was lovely, I did it for the wrong reasons, I think. And, 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 I, and I really realized after that, no, go with your heart and, and everything else will, will follow, really. Well, yeah. I remember you saying something to me. I don't, this is kind of out of time and out of context. I, I right. don't know if, if it's all right saying this, but because I, I remember you, you got asked to work with Brian Adams. And that didn't right. pan out. And because you said something, I said, well, what went wrong there, Steve? You went, it's more craft than art. Right, yeah. But Which Brian I thought was a great line. And I did listen to some of Gary Kemp's solo album this morning. Oh. There was a little bit of Brian Adams in your vocal, Gary. I must admit. Oh, yes. <laughs> I did think <laughs> that. I, 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 it was much more American than I thought it would be. Uh, it's just a little... Gr uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I didn't know you had that in. Yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a little rough. Getting old. Oh, yeah. No, it's only um, good. I was saying though, the thing with Garrett, the thing I've always loved about Garrett's voice, is certainly when he's writing, is that he's actually quite folky. Yeah. Right. He's got a folky. Well, not on those songs. Those songs were 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 were, were absolute. No, I'm saying not necessarily rating. on the finished album, but I'm yeah. saying Garrett's yeah, natural okay. bent. Well, thank you. Anyway, maybe, maybe you could do a you could do a Ganidrologue album, Gary. What <laughs> <laughs> about me? Um, I just go back to to the scream. That Susie first album the scream it's very still, different it's still you know it's probably one of the few great survivors of that era isn't it yeah well and also hong kong garden was recorded at a different studio um we then went to rack studio one for for the album um which i could really experiment more with the room miking because you know you know studio one at rack it's a big old schoolhouse and um and even Hong Kong Garden wasn't even on the screen, you know, in those days. You know, it was a pretty good sounding record. And and, um, and it sort of got me. The good thing is, you know, I had a hit with Hong Kong Garden and also had a sort of hit with the album. So that really, really started getting me going. But it was always, as I say, punk rock was a great entry point into the world of having hit records. But, you know, when Joan Armour Trading asked me to, producer or peter gabriel i mean it was like very different but you know why not you know and try and like spread the 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 because i always thought bob rock had a very unfortunate name like he could only do rock yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but, but unlike 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 chris thomas who was you know producer right. of this was album, you but suddenly got yourself seen as being the art version of, of it was art music yeah yeah it was it's always yeah, art been art for art for me art rock you know i i because that's what I, I i love i i never like and melody you know i mean i never liked the guttural singing of of some of those bands you know and i didn't yeah i didn't like it um so yeah and i'm and, and working with andy partridge who is one yeah. of the most talented people i've ever met really you know wow. 
Oh, we've, he's, we've tried to get him on the show. He's very. But that's also because they introduced. I think there was a, a level of because this is one thing I, I do wonder is if you felt ever that because you're working in this punk world, it's more of a post-punk world you're working in. If you felt there were parameters that you couldn't go outside with the stuff you wouldn't do. Because XTC, I would say, are a great example of they introduced a complexity to that. Yeah. You know, well, it was great. The music that hadn't really been there. Like in those days, you know, it was either good or bad. There was We didn't have genres. We yeah. didn't even... I don't ever remember really thinking about structure as being like, it has to be verse, chorus, verse, you know, that, I, I didn't think like that. It, it was, you know, it was all in the ears. It was never in the eyes, you know, in those days. And you must, you know, now it's all in, it's all with the eyes and it's, it's maybe a different, it's a different way of making music now. And also in those days, I would absolutely say to artists, if, if they ever like wanted to listen to something, I go, well, that's finished record. You know, we're making our own art, you know, and, 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 and if it sounded a bit like another song, you wouldn't say, great, let's change a chord and, you know, it'll be a hit. It was like, no, discard it. You know, it was very uncool to sound like someone else's record. So, you know, all through my career, it was like that. And we never, it was very uncool to, 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 to reference other people. Except, me, you know, yeah, even Bowie was, was, a, was a reference on, but it was not a, a disgust reference, you know. No, with, with Bowie, you had to find the reference. You had to find the reference, didn't you? Years yeah, yeah, later, yeah. Well, we, yeah, we did. That was the, yeah. Yeah, I yeah, don't remember ever we... doing it in the studio, and we never once referenced a song when we were making our records. You know. No, you never did. No. I, I mean, say it was... it's, a very, it's something that I've come across with people. Like, it, it's, it's a kind of 90, and it's something that Gary's discussed before, and it's a 90s thing when suddenly became, things became about looking back, and where suddenly where it became... No, it's the, the technology. Going, the... Oh, it's a... Yeah. Sorry, guy. It's the technology Perfect. leading it. The technology leads the art form, and it always has. And if the technology allows you to reference other people's records, the whole music industry, when you're in the studio, you will do that. But let's talk about making plans for Nigel, because I think that to, talking about referencing, I, I I actually put that on the other day because I'm doing doing my own album at the moment, and it was like, All oh, right. I need to listen to that record because those fantastically flanged drums of uh, of Terry Chambers at the beginning that oh. extraordinary guitar part which is so um, sort of angular and juxtaposed to the, r the rhythm but it's it's and musical it was, it was the perfect well when Barry Andrews left XTC um and then they got Dave Gregory in and it became so much simpler you you've got the two guitars left and right and they would always play completely different things so for me I was really influenced by if you, if a band had two guitar players, why play the same thing? Mm -hmm. Because I, I I got that thing with XTC that you've got, and it's just perfect to to have the two guitars left and right. You've got, and Colin Moulding, he was such a sweetheart. I would say to him, how do you want the bass to sound? He goes, I want it sort of wo woolly and indistinct. <laughs> you know exactly the opposite of really what a, you know well, which is funny because he he plays beautifully constructed parts doesn't oh, I mean like yeah really fantastic I mean, just fant every single member to terry chambers i went to see him the other day in new york about six months ago and he's got this band called x e x t c which is just him a very good guitar player singer and a bass player and they play like all of XTC songs, and oh, it was wow. it was just amazing, you know. Yeah. And um, but where yes, did that XT. where did that drop? Again, that's, yeah, it's good tribute like, tribute band right. names now. I like uh, or you know people. Uh, it's like it's like hairdressers' names used to be in the seventies, wasn't it? Who's got the best right. pump? <laughs> you, you, that drum sound was it was still using yeah. you know, a lot of floor toms as hi hats instead. You know, funny, you know. And so there's there's a there's a hangover from from Susie there, and but also yeah. the flanging was that your idea at the front? I, at the front. No, that was Hugh did that. I remember that. But um, because it's your first it was, workshop with Hugh, isn't it? Hugh Padden. Yes. No. Well, actually, we done Life Begins at the Hop, which was done before the album. Um, but yeah, it was the first time I, I I only ever did three three albums with Hugh, which was two XTC and a Peter Gabriel. Is this when Hugh was staff engineer at the Townhouse? Because yeah. because this is what something that is very I certain to me is very important to your career is the Townhouse. 
which became yeah. absolutely your domain in the 80s. That was your studio. Well, it was. I mean, Hugh was yeah. staff engineer at the townhouse and, yeah. and no one there had ever thought that there was anything different between Studio One and Studio Two. But I walked in and saw that room in Studio Two and say, you know, because I'd, I'd been, before then, I'd been experimenting with ambience and compression on Susie and the Banshees, you know, you, th th there's a sort of lineage that that you can listen to before we came up with the drum sound, you know, of Peter Gabriel. You know, as Hugh is a lovely guy, but but he's not a pusher. You know, he doesn't like push the things. Peter Gabriel was. Uh, I mean, he was. You know, anything like I did, he goes, "That's great. Do it more." You know, so it was it was a great combination of the of the you know, of the, of the creatives. So yeah, when, when Peter Gabriel asked me to do the album and we were discussing it, he said, Steve, I don't want any symbols on the album. And for me, it was like, you know, maybe some producers will go, well, you know, blah, 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 you need that. But I, for me, it was like, great. How do we get, what sounds can we do? What can we do? Because, you know, if you have limitations in art, as you well know, it's actually a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got a bass player who can only go boom, 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 then you have to make the record sound brilliant with a bass line that goes boom, 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 boom. And I worked with a great band who had a bass player like that. And you too. I mean, yes, of course. So, so the 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 limitations in art is what I think enables you to concentrate on the things that are unique you know, which is pushing yourself. It's like in those days, if you wanted to like, okay, I was doing Simple Minds and we're on the very last song of the album. And there was one sort of average song, but it had a really good verse. So we decided at three o'clock in the morning, a song called Easter Easter on Sparkling oh, yeah, in the Rain. Yeah. We decided to, to, to chop the verses, just, just repeat the verses like three times. Uh, to make the song and but but to do that we had to run in another tape machine from studio one at the townhouse and we had to run the, the leads from tape machine to tape machine copy it and then chop the 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 the, 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 the like we did it four times we just repeated the verse how you used to be exactly now you do it in in 10 seconds but it was fantastic to you know to be able to do that then I was going to say, just referring back to your thing of um, like the no symbols thing, for instance, yeah. the drum sound, that one on Intruder, if there were symbols, you couldn't have done that. No, there would have been, exactly. it would have been just too noisy. You, you know, that you could not yeah. have, have gone that far with the drums. Yeah. Well, and Phil Collins was brilliant. I mean, I think probably, probably the best drummer I've ever recorded because Phil Collins can be Ringo, you know, People like Simon Phillips and and uh, and all these other guys are brilliant drummers. And Carter Beauford from Dave Matthews Band, incredible drummer, but they can't be Ringo. And it's very important to be able to be Ringo as well as Mr. Paradiddle, you know. And Phil was brilliant. Compliment the song, which is what Ringo always did. Yeah, exactly. And and, and Phil can Phil was brilliant at that. And the other drummer on the album, a guy called Jerry Marotta, was a Jerry Marotta. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's he's a lovely guy, but but it's like. He's a big guy. There's a lot of him. Yes, yeah, and he yeah, he wanted, he wanted Jerry, to be yeah. he wanted to play, you know, yeah. but uh, but no, Peter wouldn't let him. And and that so much of the sound on that album was through this little plastic box, um, called an we called it a nine ninety five because that's how much it cost. It was a little speaker from Radio Shack. Now we had a, a synth player called Larry Fast. Oh, a genius! Who is a genius? genius. But he's yeah. such a a, a, a humble, gentle New Yorker, you know, and and he would sit at the back of the control room with his Profit Five, uh, and just he didn't want to say, "Can you put this through the speakers so I can get a sound?" So he had this little speaker, so he would like put it up to his ear like that, and when he had a, something that he liked, he would go, "Listen to this." We go, "Oh," and it always sounded brilliant through this little plastic speaker when you turned it up full and distorted it. So all the distortion on the Peter Gabriel album, I mean, you can go back and listen to it now and you, you hear the signature, ah, that, because we ended up feeding backing vocals through it. And at one point, Peter had, um, he had thing, something coming out of the speaker and he had the microphone and, um, and he went like that. 
So it was like a fucked up version of the Peter Frampton voice box, you know. Was, was in the back of your mind that kid who bought John Bonham in there somewhere that cre- helped you to create? You know, I I was never a, I was never a Led Zeppelin fan. You know, his voice was never. I don't like that screechy. Because that still is a great drum sound. It's isn't a it? great drum sound, yeah. But I, I but no, Led Zeppelin was never. I, I mean, I was aware of it, but they weren't one of my favourites in those days. I can you know. tell. I think no, I've... never really. I mean, weirdly, yeah. weirdly, I, 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 and all those, all those sort of squeeze my lemon, and I mean it was just all a bit manly. You mentioned Simple Minds. Um, did, yeah, you had Jim on, of was course. There, yeah, was there a concern with you that you you thought I, you know, I can't do you two and Simple Minds because they're living in the same world, and obviously Simple Minds did and Big Country. Even though Simple I mean, Minds, yeah. to be honest, their first albums you know of, of electronica were very close to ultravox you know i can see that connection but no 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 on, they became kind of, it, so did you go into the studio i can't do that you took them kind of from that to the I, it was about your job was to make them the stadium simple minds it seemed I well don't know, it might... yeah it was weird it was weird because actually i had been contracted to work with a band from canada called rush right, right. And I and and at this point, Rush were the biggest band in the world in 1983. And um, and I'd met them and I got on very well with Geddy Lee and 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 I'd been to see the studio in in Montreal where they lived. And the idea was, you know, that the studio date was booked. And um, and a month before this recording session, I get the call from Simple Minds. Would you like to produce our album? And I went, oh, yeah, I'd love to. Then I went, oh, hang on. I think I'm supposed to be doing Rush. I better call them up and tell them I can't do it. And this was the only time in my career that I've been sort of threatened, you will never work in this business again. Because I called up Rush's manager and, and I said, look, I'm terribly sorry, but I, I can't do your album. And he goes, and it was like, what do you mean? He said, you're, you know, it's all done. You know, you're doing the album. I said, no, 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 don't you understand? If I don't want to do your album, it means that I'm not going to do a very good job. So if I say I'm not doing your album, there's nothing, you know, I was fearless, completely fearless. I why mean, did you not want to, why did you prefer Simple Minds to, to Rush? Well, because I, I then, I then came to my senses and realized I fucking can't stand his voice. Rush in 1983, especially with the sort of work you've been doing. I mean, that is, it's, it's a step outside, isn't it? Yeah, and so that was why I wanted to do it. But, you know, I mean, Geddy Lee hates me. And even now, if you Google Geddy Lee, Steve Lillywhite, it's like, I was very disappointed with Steve Lillywhite. And it was like, come on, that that album, the, the album that Rush did was huge. Which, yeah, which was it? Was it 21? It was, they, they ended up working with a, a, a that little fella, Peter Collins. He ended up going to Nashville. and But yeah, they worked with an English guy. But no, it was so... I'd, and also, of course, I always say when I tell this story, it was when I met Kirsty because Kirsty came in to do some backing vocals for Simple Minds, right. and and I and I basically saw her in the studio, and I went, I'm going to marry that girl. She had no idea that that was my idea. I mean, I was 30 years old, she was 25 years old, and I sort of press ganged her, and that was a. You know, beginning of that was when I really what a what a great and what a great great. And you know what I was, was thinking, on guys, every, on every front, Steve. You know, I was yeah, but, but I was going to speak to you, magnificent couple, guy, because you you know, Kirsty would have been fantastic on this, and and you know, you could oh actually, god, yeah, you god, could do a you know, I would love to do an and you know, you could do an episode about Kirsty with people, which might yeah, I mean just idea. just but just a little a idea, idea for you for that's a great you know, idea to, great, to, yeah. to to you know um, because. You know, there's so much that you can talk about, you know, yeah. a, a, about her, you know, because as you know, you know, the, the, the fiery redhead was um, was what she was in tabloid speak. You know, she was amazing. Yeah. And certainly uh, one of the uh, most talented people I've ever worked with. D- ab- 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 you know, you know, there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a new there's a box set out. There's an eight CD box set of hers and it has Pino Palladino soloing throughout the whole album. Literally soloing <laughs> throughout the whole album. <laughs> Amazing! <laughs> it's so funny because you produced obviously that great fairy tale of New York, which you're all about to listen to, to here again, over and over again. Uh, well, no, except the first time you hear it, it's nice because you go, oh, 
it oh, was, it's still nice. It's still one of the great lyrics and great, great songs. Oh, I th- for, for me, the greatest lyric I've ever recorded was, I uh, I could have been someone, well, so could, so anyone. could anyone. Absolutely. It's one I mean, of the greatest lines ever written. Brilliant. And yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and oh, I, I hope Shane's okay. Shane is in the hospital at the moment. Well, I was going to ask how he was. Well, I, I just follow Victoria, his wife, on Instagram, and she posted a picture yesterday of her kissing him with, he's got like the, 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 the drip. And, uh, and then the long talk about not to be scared and moving on to another place with the angels and all that. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, so I, I don't know. I mean, a few months ago he was, but then he got better, but maybe not now. I don't, I don't know, so I can't say. How was it recording those two together? Did you actually record them singing to the same? No, not no. at all. Not you, of course not. <laughs> no, well, <laughs> I recorded the intro of Fairy Tale of New York with just piano and voice. The I could have been, uh, uh, it was Christmas Eve, Christmas baby, Eve. in the drunk tank, that drunk bit. Tank. So we just, and, and because the piano and the voice were bleeding onto each other's tracks, we had to choose uh, them both together. At the same, you know, you couldn't take the voice from one and the piano from another because it would bleed. So we did it like ten times, and we chose one take, and then the band went in and recorded the rest of the song, and I I spliced the two together. Now that was one thing they said we've tried to record this song so many times, but we could never do it because of the the the, the, the transition between the two parts of the song. And I said, well, you know, let me chop it together. So so it was simple solution to a problem that no one you know um and and um and and then they were you know they were they had some lofty ideals they wanted chrissy hine to sing it and stuff and i and it was really that you know i had a studio at home so we i said look let's get kirsty to do a guide vocal and if you know she'll do it for nothing and you know see what you think so i literally i remember shane giving me a copy of the lyrics and him tearing out the bits of lyric that that he sang. So this is this is what she's got to sing, you know. Like I mean, he was just. I mean, I mean, I never got that close to him because he was very different person, hmm. you know. To you know, I, every other member of the band, I, I got on great with. And well, I remember get, him from going to punk concerts as a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 you'd always avoid him as much as you. Can. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was a very powerful person. Yeah. You once described it. Uh, it's a lovely description because you're you're really good at these, Steve. You I remember <laughs> you saying to me that how him and Keith Richards were the only, the two, only two genuinely bohemian. bohemians bohemian. you'd ever met. Yeah. And, well, well, if you could say because I said, and how would you describe that? And the way you put it was, well, they could get up at eight o'clock in the morning, but it was completely by chance. Yeah. And then literally, <laughs> don't care whose jacket they're wearing. Okay, no. yeah. I mean, uh, it's, you know, it, it's like they don't smoke their own brand of cigarettes. It's like, I mean, although Keith <laughs> Keith would only smoke Marlboro, but Shane, you know, he would, you know, it would be completely, um, yeah. But but he was fantastic, and 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 the great thing is, is I mean, I got that band when they, you know, but I would have to record them early, you know, and 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 again, you 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 look at the whole project and you look at the whole album and you think, how can I maximize the potential of this music you know it's nothing to do with this is what i do and even though at the time yeah i was doing all those drum sounds but you know that bit me in the ass at one point you know and then i realized i can't do the same sound on every record because i've worked with this guy called marshall crenshaw and i it was not successful and i and i did this because we did it at the power station in new york so i i did all my usual things you know and then I realized again, you know, you should always enter into a project without any preconception as to what, you know, I, 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 I'm not a big fan of pre-production. So weirdly. for a bit, you thought you had a motif. No, that's true. Yeah. You? you thought you had a I motif. Uh, yeah, well, I, I did, yeah. But, but then I realized that motif means nothing, you know, because you have, that's, Chris Thomas is, was at, in his day was a brilliant a brilliant producer of, of probably the type I am, which is where you try and enhance the best of, you know, Trevor is absolutely brilliant. You know, I mean, he is my favorite producer of all time, mm-hmm. but you know, he, um, I, I can't ever sort of play at that level, you know? So I have to understand what I'm good at and, 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 you know, like ego can get in the way of a, a lot of people have a hit 
and then they fall by the wayside because they think they're better than they are. You know, they have this thing that they can, because they've had a hit, they can turn anything into a hit. And I, I always thought, I'm a fan. If I like their music, then I want to be able to make it into something great for them. You know, that was really my, my, my idea. And if you have a hit single, it's great. Okay, let's talk about the band then. Which one? The Irish Boys. Oh, yes, yes. You obviously did their first three albums and other, and other stuff with them later on. But So I'm taking it. You mentioned you saying that you wanted to be your own A&R man. Did you sort of discover them, Steve? Or? Yeah, yeah. I remember getting sent a cassette of their, uh, well, it was demos, but it was also their independent release in Ireland. Um, uh, <laughs> produced by Chaz Wally, I think. Um, weirdly, oh. um, who was an a and man at CBS. I think I'm right at saying that. He, he could be part of your, he could now join your 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 songwriting duo. Yeah, Wally Pratt and Lily White. Yeah. <laughs> Lily White, Pratt and Wally. <laughs> to Wally yeah. <laughs> and I remember thinking it was a little, I, and I liked it, but, you know, in those days, and still now, if I was to produce again, I would like to see them live. Because for me, when an artist plays live, they're not thinking about what they're doing. And part of my job in a studio is to enable them to be creative and not having to think really what they're doing. You know, I mean, it's, it's a weird thing, but if they're analyzing too much, stays to remember, recording studios was Star Trek. People didn't have yeah. anything at home. So it was like, it's a studio, oh my God. And, and I'd been, King of the studio since I well I'd been in studio since I was seventeen so even when I well you'd been locked in a room at the back <laughs> well yeah but I exactly <laughs> but still I was part I I got it by osmosis yeah, yeah. and um so when I I was twenty four on the first U two album Bono was nineteen Adam was nineteen and Larry was seventeen so even though we were close in age there's a big there's a big gap. You know, five years at that age. Oh, it's huge. Um, it's it's huge in those days. So I was, um, and and I'm very proud actually that that I was the first person ever to make a successful rock album in Ireland, because Thin Lizzy, Rory Gallagher, uh, Boomtown Rats, they all came over to London Where to did make you do it? their at windmill. Was it windmill? At windmill Lane, yeah. And of course, you know, I walked into Windmill Lane and 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 it was a studio made for recording folk music. Well, yeah. you worked then, right? Because you lived there yeah. for a while. We're, we're walking through the, the 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 reception of Windmill Lane, it was like this nice stone place. And that was where the girls sat, you know, because there weren't mobile phones. So if you needed mm -hmm. to speak to someone, you call the main number and the receptionist would put it through to the different studios, you know. Or, and it, there was also the video editing at Wimble Lane upstairs, right? You remember that? So I um, wanted to record the drums in the hallway. She said, but that's where the girl sits. I go, well, what time does she go home? She, she goes home at six o'clock. I said, okay, we'll record the drums after six o'clock. At which, at which point Larry had a problem because his dad said he had to be home. <laughs> because um, cause, because you know, he was only 17 and his dad was worried about him. So so on the, the, the boy album, it was very much a, you know, but even then, you know, Bono hadn't finished all his lyrics. They, they, I think I work best with those sort of people who aren't craftsmen as songwriters. And, and I do believe in that, in, in, in making something in the studio that setting up a scene that can make a unique situation. Did you sense that The Edge had a sound that could yeah. make this band unique? Well, yes, he he was definitely the, the the metronome of the band. You know, he would play through the echo. So that was the that was the sort of tempo of 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 how they worked. Um um, it's funny cause, cause, because because those those echoes like the memory man and stuff that he used to yeah. use. Because what what's interesting is that yes, everything's set to that time, but you couldn't precisely set those times, could you? No, it no, no, just, no. So it yeah. was. I didn't use a click with them until the third album. Using a click, I don't know about you. Did you make ever, ever make your records without a click track, Gary? No, we were, we use clicks. Ev everyone, yeah. 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 So it was clicking was, in his headphones while he was playing. Yeah. 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 
No, we I on the first two U2 albums, I, I didn't really start doing clicks until 1983. And it was a fantastic thing, but it was also it was sometimes if the musicians couldn't play well to the click, it just felt like it was slowing down. You know, when there was a drum fill, it felt like it was so well, it, so we, it was, all know, it, we all know from computer music that we make, you know, it, now it's so rigid, isn't it? There's no movement. Double time is not double time. And right. half time is not half time. Well, you and look at which, a drummer which, like... you've got a click, it is, you know. Yeah, I mean, Stuart Copeland, you know, he is, his whole tempo and rhythm is so at the front of the beat. It's fantastic, mm. you know, and it's like pushing, pushing, pushing at the front. But then you've got like say Jerry Marotta or his brother, Rick Marotta, those big, those like American or, or the band, you know, those sort of people who right on the back end of the beat, you Nick know, Mason, Nick Mason, absolutely. You know, and, and it's, it's, it's wonderful. The, the nuance between all the different styles and, and that's what is slightly missing in musicians now because mm -hmm. drummers are fantastic now playing to clicks, you know, because they can give and they take and they, they, it's almost like they don't have to be completely in with the click for it to work. They just like to hear it for something. Anyway, I'll, back to you too. Cause, back yes, to you too. What would you like to know? Also what you were saying about how you like every album to be different and to have moved yeah, forward, yeah. which is so true. Because also I remember, listen, I was probably for the Adam episode listening to that first U2 album. And it's just an extraordinary thing. A, you can hear all sorts of outside influences that you wouldn't have thought of before, Echo and the Bunnymen, stuff like that. Yeah. But also, everything is there. Everything that is coming is there. Yeah, I you did know. a lot of bass overdubs with that, and we would stay after the rest of the band went home because, you know, they, it's well known. They were, you know, Bono, Edge and Larry were very much the the sort of Christian boys. And, and Adam was more my, my partying partner. You know, so we would your speed, uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, and so we would stay in the studio afterwards and we'd down to Lily's. Lily White went L to L Lily's Bordello. Oh my Lily's god, Lily's fantastic! The oh, those, yeah, the pink elephant as well, and um, all those, all those ones underneath. Oh, yeah, Leeson there, there was some Street. great underneath Leeson Street, Leeson Street, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but you know, Edge only had one guitar, so it was, you know, I, I, I wanted to put some some flavors on the music. I didn't just want to record the band faithfully. For me, that's like, that's not using the recording studio to its great advantage. So it was like, I mean, we didn't even have a synthesizer. So on one song, we played the the, the tuner and, and we played that. Um, and I like covered it with all these chorusings and, and echoes and stuff like that. And, and it was, Oh, it was fantastic. Um, I was just in the studio with you two, like a you know, six weeks ago. Oh, tell us, tell us. Recording their new single called Atomic City. So great you're back with them again. I know. Well, I, I was in Vegas um, consulting, son doing the sound consultation for those gigs at the Spear. Oh, man, what a gig. How That's was it? Amazing. How, what, what was that like? I tell you, sitting at the top table was fantastic. Uh, it really is. The mo I went to see Adele. It was great, but it was boring. Go to see this U2 show. You've never seen anything like it in the sphere. Now, I just want to uh, ask, because what it seemed to me, and when I was looking on Instagram and various places at the videos of it, I was worried that the band was so diminished by, by the visuals. No. You see, they're very clever. And this was one of the things that we worked on, was like there's a middle section, it, we got Act 2, it's called. Like the first eight songs are all from Actung Baby. Then act two, they do, and it was actually my idea. I said, why don't you do each act two rotate a different album? So they did, um, they, they, they did a, a Rattle and Harm. They did All That You Can't Leave Behind. And I just noticed the other day they did a war one where they did three songs acoustically or a different version, you know. So, and that's where, honestly, Bono just throws in some ridiculous things. And it's all unrehearsed. And, you know, if Bono starts singing another song over, you know, because U2 chords are very simple. You can sing a hundred songs over every single chord. So Bono will do that. Edge immediately knows how to go. And you look at Adam and poor old Adam, he has no idea. <laughs> Adam is great when he's on the tracks, you know, but take him off the tracks. He cannot, <laughs> he can't <laughs> react like that. Yeah. You know? But it's really funny because they, it's so sloppy. 
but it works because you've got this crazy Humanized. yeah it's it humanizes them and then they go back to to to, to more acting baby some of the guitar playing on it is spectacular you wouldn't believe it's it, it really really i was so proud of them how was wow. it working later on of course feeling that you were having to work in this cooperative if you like with with daniel lanoir and eno flood all the lineup you know yeah we we never worked together it was a relay race it was you know nowadays records are relay races you've got the, the guy who does the beats then we give it to the guy who does the vocals then we give it to the guy who does the mixing but how you did know, it work the, with you well that was we were the it was like a relay race i would run the final leg you know basically where the streets have no name. I walked into the studio while they were working on that song and Brian Eno was putting a barber's shop quartet singing on it, on the outro. And I went, they fucking lost the plot, haven't they? And, they, <laughs> they said, and, and Brian and Danny said to me, Steve, we've, we don't know what we're doing with this song. It's yours. So, you know, me with my fresh energy managed to, you know, I'm with the band, we 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 worked through it. Um, my job became that really more like. But 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 then it became as it as it went on over the years. That then you 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 would always get a call for some of I it. Get the you? call. I was like in. Red Adair. I you remember, know. do you know what, sorry if I could just interject, because I remember being around at your house in Ealing one night, just <laughs> having a nice time with you and Kirsty, and, and the phone went, it was the front phone in the hall, as was right. back in the days, and Kirsty went out and got the phone, and, and uh, she went, Steve, Steve, come in, called you out, and then Kirsty just came back in and went, he's got the call. Uh, no, and right. That was it, and nothing, and nothing needed to be said, we knew who it was. <laughs> yeah, and of course, you know, on Joshua Tree, it's well known, but, but, but Kirsty literally, she did the running order of that album in about 10 minutes. You know, we were just, we were at the end. Everyone was so fried. Um, I, I wasn't as fried because I was only there for like two months, you know, but, but they'd done 18 months of of, of, of of work on the album. Are you coming in for the mixing, Steve? Or are you coming? It's not like, it's like, a. It's as I say, it's like a relay race. I ran the final leg and I was considered the guy who did singles, you know, which is so weird because I have no pedigree of being the guy who does singles, but, but I'm much more that guy than, than Brian Eno and Danny Lenoir who have no idea when a song is finished. You know, my, I'm, I'm a good closer. I'm a good at like, okay, what do we need? Let's get this song finished. Does there it have- are okay with that. But there he goes, we're okay with that. Yeah, because weirdly, they saw me as the guy who was, you know, that I was their very first studio person, really. So they trusted me. You know, I remember sitting in the studio on the first album and there was a the couch behind me and I would be there at the desk and, and I heard giggling behind me and I turned around and they literally all went like this, like teacher. So I was, I was, you know, even though I was only five years older than them, it was considered I was, you know, I was like teacher. So they trusted me. I said to Bono once, though, many years later after all this, I said, you know, I know I'm a nice guy, Bono, but you always ask me back, why do you like me to come back? And he goes, one word. I go, what's that? He says, clarity. And it's really? weird. I, I don't feel like I have clarity at all, really. But I'll, <laughs> I won't tell him that. <laughs> he, he trusts you, obviously. He trusts you with, with, yeah. with his work, which he's very, very precious about, obviously, for, for good reasons. Yeah, he, 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 he goes above and beyond. You know, I mean, isn't there, isn't there a worry that this can breed sort of uh, in the people going before? It's like for Lanoir and everyone going, oh, fuck, it's fine. Steve Liddy was going to sort it out anyway. <laughs> You know, well, I don't know if they ever think like that. No, I'm, I'm I, I sure don't know, but I'm, I'm sure they don't. But I'll give you a good. There's a great example of of of, of the sort of ambition. On, um, I had a slightly different job on the Vertigo album called "How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb," because that was actually the only time they've had to let a producer go. It's Chris Thomas. You know, was... Yeah, I won't say his name, but you said his name. It was Chris Thomas, but he. You know, when I walked in, I said, you know, let me hear all the songs. And and there was a song called Native Son, which I listened to. And I went, oh, that's a good song. But I don't like how it's been recorded. It's too safe. You know, we can make it better. And they said, OK, you know, over to you, Steve. So I set the band up in a different way. And, and I said, OK, we've got a finished song now. So Bono, you go out and do a live vocal with the band because this is 
you know, because normally Bono would write the lyrics after the after the music was done. So it was done separately. But I said, here we have a finished song. So you go out and sing. He went out there, got the mic halfway through the song. He put the mic down, came into the control room and said, I said, well, what are you doing? He goes, I can't sing that. No, can't sing that. Now, you can go on YouTube, put in U2 Native Son, and you can hear what becomes Vertigo. Now, Native Son's a pretty damn good song. The thing about it, though, is Vertigo is still a classic live song of theirs. So it, it, there's something visceral about well, that's it. That's because the original tape got stolen, did it? Uh, the, the, no, 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 no. Native well, Son. How did it was... get out there? How did it get out there? Because it was on the U2 iPod, which was pretty much included 12 remixes of Discotech, uh, along with uh, Native Son. But it was tucked right in at the very end of the U2 iPod. Someone then ripped it and put it on YouTube. You know, so, so you can go and listen to it. And it's, and it's, very, it's good, you know, but it's not Vertigo. Vertigo has something about it. You know, so um, and I produced Vertigo completely from the beginning. So that was, ah. you know, so, so they, was, they have a different process, aren't they? They're writing in the studio as opposed to oh, they, they you mix it before they write it. Literally. I mean, <laughs> wow. I mean, honestly, I mean, OK, so I can. This is what happens. I can do a mix. Bono comes in, and goes, I love it. Sounds great. Just give me a microphone. I can sing it better. So he give him a microphone and he sings it and you go. Oh, well, that's a really good vocal because he's a great singer. But then you go, I'm not quite sure what the lyrics are on that bit. Realize he hasn't actually written the lyrics. He's just bluffing, but he does a better vocal. And then he goes, it's great. Needs a bit more music though. Edge. So Edge puts on his guitar and of course diddles a little bit and changes a couple of chords. Well, that's good. Hmm, need to change the bass now. Uh... Is that the right drum beat? Three weeks later, I'm going, he loved the mix of this song. Now, so it goes like that. When I was, uh, just after I'd done Beautiful Day with them, they said, we've got two more songs for you, Steve. One is called Walk On and one is called Home. I said, okay, great. And I listened to both. And I said, well, Walk On has got this great chorus. Walk on, walk on. But I don't, the verse isn't great. And Home has got a really good verse, but wow. doesn't really have much of a chorus. So I, they said, oh, funny you should say that. At one point, it was the same song. <laughs> it split into two songs. So I said, just put it back into the same song then. And um, the lyrics were different, but it was, uh, it, it worked. So, Love that. you know, it's a little, I, I mean, it's just very simple things, you know. Uh, just quickly, the Stones, because you, 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 you Stones. Were, you I, I, you're talking I, about this, two distinctive guitars. You can't yes, get I, two distinctive guitars. No, I know. Oh, well, and there's I, a I, great, I, there's a great line you had about that at the time, which I'll let you tell the story first. Well, I, I, I think I, I've just, said this before, but I always say I produced the worst ever Rolling Stones album until the next one. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I'll tell you the, the line you gave me at the time, okay. which was brilliant. Which, which is, uh, you know, I said, Steve, what's it like? And you said. It was like um, it was like a marriage that's being kept together for the sake of the children. The children being the new virgin deal. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> okay. Yes, it was a bit like. Well, sure, we all know that, that Mick would love to make a living without the Stones, you know, and he's done so many things, but he's never had success. Now, Keith is a complete luddite, but there's one thing about Keith is that the music was always more important than the lifestyle. You know, which is why whenever he felt it seemed like Keith might go the way of all the other people who lived the Keith Richards lifestyle, because he owns that thing, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. The Keith Richards lifestyle. It's like, mm -hmm. but in fact, actually, the part of the lifestyle that is that you never talk about is the absolute love of music. And that's the thing that's kept him from 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 overdoing mm -hmm. it. But he's very, very Luddite in his, uh, you know, it's very simple. And the Stones still record in that way. Have you heard the, I mean, I'm not a big fan of that song, Angry. It's like a, it's a Mick Jagger sort of pop song. And I, that's not. No, the album, the album's got some good stuff on there. The it does. And I love that song with Gaga. And you know, I really that's, like, yeah, oh, love yeah, it, yeah. The thing of that. Exile. Okay, that's great. Love yeah, and just so, just the I, way it goes on, it's fantastic. The whole act two of it is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, really it's like great. the way the guitars are recorded as well. I mean, you know, it's like like all modern records, they suffer from so much compression, which seems to be the yeah the, the thing at the moment. 
I know, I know. I don't know about modern records. I I, I love listening to my Stackridge and my... Oh, oh <laughs> likes to hear that. Um, perfect. That's a perfect rock on tours band mentioned. Well done. <laughs> Guy, you've got such a great memory of those days. You know. Oh, but there was such happy times. I don't know if we really got time because of all, all my time recording it. I mean, like, I was really hoping we'd we'd you could, we could tell the the story of where the title of kite comes from. Who, yes, who was that? Yeah. kite was because this is one of the proudest things in my career. Because I love it because I, I I started working with Steve and with Kirsty. I was foisted on you by Johnny Marr, basically, wasn't I? So right, got, I think so. Use yeah. my mate, and then um, and we end up doing loads of stuff. And then then I went off and did the Floyd thing. And then, so you asked me if I could get, if I'd asked David to play on Kirsty's album, which of course he did. Right. And then, so there's this wonderful thing. Yeah, there's this wonderful thing. I think it's Waving or Drowning, or Little, which song it is. Yeah. But thanks to that, there is one song in the world where the guitar, it's a Kirsty McCall song, and the guitar credit is David Gilmore and Johnny Marr. It's just <laughs> the coolest thing ever. That's great. But, but, but yeah, basically, the story the, uh, of the title, the, this the is title the album was Kite. Kite. We, we, we said, you know, what do you. When Dave Gilmore plays on your record, what do you give him? You know, so uh, you know, you did like, you know, what's your session? Double, double session? I don't know. <laughs> so we said to him, "What, what, what can we do for you, David?" And he says, "Send a kite to Armenia," and we still, to this day, don't know how much money exactly a kite is. No, I, I, th- I don't know because you. I remember you called me. Said, "Guy, he wants to send a kite." I mean, what's a kite? I mean, the, these yeah. people are at war. They don't want to be playing games right. i i think that it means check in some weird oh. rhyming slang that oh, no one five, knows 500 quid is a monkey or a carpet one of those words but it's right not, right 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 yeah. I, 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 my my but thought it, was a kite was just another no i a, think it means check but i'm check. not okay. no one knows i've asked him no one knows can you can you no. ask me skill more please guy i think <laughs> i have several times is he done? I mean, it's very obscure. Is it? It's the sort of thing you'd pull out on an Eno card, isn't it? Send a card. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oblique strategies. What a fantastic. Oh, yeah. Have you ever worked? I've got, with... I've got a set. I've got a set. You do. Here's yeah. a. You know, the great thing about Brian Eno is that he is probably one of the brainiest people on the planet. Yeah, I went. To, I saw him play the other night. He did. A oh, you saw Brian? The, yeah, I, he played with the Baltic um, Philharmonic at. Oh. Uh, at the Royal Festival Hall, and it was amazing. I've never seen an orchestra used like like that, where they would literally come on and they were wandering around. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. They yeah. were a part of it. It was an amazing thing to see an orchestra used like that. It was brilliant. Yeah. No, he, 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 I, I did a week with him. Okay, I said this is my um, one right. of my real box ticks. I did a week. No, it was a week with when Roxy Music tried to do an album, and it was literally 1972. It was Chris Thomas, right? Uh, Brian Eno, and with the five of them. Right. And um and it split into two camps immediately and no one talked to each other and kind of nothing came of it. Oh. <laughs> well <laughs> <laughs> And Brian, in fact, Brian went on record, Brian Eno saying it was atomically the same as nineteen seventy two. Fantastic. Steve, thank you so much for coming on. I mean my uh, God, I, mean, I feel really... like I've been in so many rooms, including that rather claustrophobic one at the beginning. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fantastic! Thank you so much, boys. So good, Steve. so good, and like I said, and it's you know only scratched the surface. It feels it's Brett. I mean, you know what a life, Steve. What a life. Well done. We salute you. you. Great to see oh, you. Thank we're, you. We'd love to, see to you, catch. We'd love to to meet you properly if you come to London. Uh, yeah, yeah, we can do it. We can do. I, I'll, we can do an in person one if you want. Yeah. Oh yeah 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 yeah. Would love that, guy. Amazing. So much of the important soundtrack of our one hundred our lives. One hundred percent. I mean, and then we're, I think the influences and the way he's drawn out of, of certain things within bands that have become, um, you know, motifs for a genre, you know, that some of those guitar parts and those drum parts that he created in the late seventies, early night eighties. Yeah, no, he's shaped, he shaped the, you know, that you now realize that those, those records, those, you know, XDC, Susan, the Banshees, they went on to shape everything that came after it in a way. I, I never even mentioned Hiroshima Mon Amour. I mean, what, no, exactly. the Ha 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 Ultravox album, but absolutely. I mean, that was, was, was one of the, the, the records that was always played by Rusty Egan in the Blitz inspired all Yes. Yeah. Thank you for helping get him on guy. Oh, it's what we do, Gary. That's what we do. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you to Ben Jones, who's obviously uh, sitting there producing this brilliantly every week. Um, uh, and also, I mean, thanks. Isn't that like that Steve has said he has literally listened to every single one? 
That's amazing. I don't think I've even done that. No, I, I, I always just what, flip is, through, what, what does that say about life in Bali? <laughs> <laughs> I flip through your bit and listen to every yeah, all the course, yeah, course. yeah. No, I flip through you to get to the ads. <laughs> all right, it's good night from me, and it's good night from them. Rock on Tours is produced by Gimme Sugar Productions, a Warner Music Group UK.